We make things. We use our hands, minds, and machines to build, to fix, to improve. We're known as do-it-yourselfers, home improvement fans, fix-it fanatics, inventors. At our core, though, we're all makers. So let's jump in and make something. Hi, I'm Ron Hazelton. Welcome to the show. Today we're going to add needed storage and display space to a children's art room by creating a recessed cabinet that's flush with the wall. Two of the cabinet sections have shelving and the third includes a built-in bulletin board. Then we'll try out a new tool designed specifically for removing wood trim quickly and without damaging the trim itself. If you're looking for a way to add detail and interest to a room without a lot of expense or work, think molding or maybe I should say more molding. Layering molding on top of what's already there can turn the plainest of trim into something exceptional. Well, I'm on the road again, headed to Mechanicsville, Virginia to visit Steve and Katie Gormanlove. Steve and Katie explained that they really don't have any building experience. However, the arts and crafts room they created for their children shows off Katie's keen eye for design. Oh, look at this. It's a 63 Comet we had a friend of ours build for us. They must just love this. They like it, yeah. Well, I would love to have had this as a kid. Me too, yeah. me too. That's why you probably did it. That's why we've right. done it, right. That's right. Uh, well, tell me about the project. Well, what we thought was we want to have recessed shelves here so they can just... Rather than remove wall studs to create our recessed shelves, we're going to build these shelves into the spaces or bays between the studs. They can just reach in and get their magic markers, their cotton balls, their shelves, whatever they happen to be working on. Our game plan is to first locate the wall studs, then cut open the spaces in between, and finally build individual cabinets to fit those openings. An electronic stud finder quickly locates the wall studs. For confirmation, though, I always resort to my reliable hammer and nail method. Okay, there's nothing there. I'm just going to move it over like a quarter of an inch at a time. There you go, right there. Okay, so this is the actual edge of the stud right here. Now that we've nailed down the stud locations, Steve and I draw their positions on the wall so we'll know exactly where to cut the openings. Before we actually cut this out, let's uh, cut a little inspection hole. A small inspection hole will allow us to take a peek inside the wall and discover potential surprises such as pipes and wiring before we commit to major surgery. No more. The angle. There you go. That's it. Sawing the edges of the inspection hole at a 45 degree angle prepared. will keep the cutout from falling into the wall and allow it to be used as a quick patch if our inspection reveals a problem. I'm very glad we did this. What are we saying? I'm very there? glad we did this. You know what I want you to do is to put your hand in this hole and reach to the left. Okay. <clears throat> oh, sure enough. We've got some plumbing back there, don't we? Hmm. Ah, the best laid plans. Well, it looks like it's time to reconsider. Okay, this one we can't use. Too many pipes. Okay. This one's okay. Got one small oh. wire here. Um, we could check this out this might be available to us and then we'd have a bay here and a bay here are you concerned about it being off center no i think that's fine we'll still get the storage we had planned on and we can consider another alternative like yeah. maybe bullet and board i think might be fun okay can... you know i like a frame you know offset these two okay mm -hmm. now we're ready for some cutting now katie thought this might be a good time to use power tools but this is a job better done with a handheld wallboard saw it cuts quickly, makes less dust, and lessens the chance we'll accidentally cut through some hidden plumbing or electrical line. <laughs> we should probably stop about right here, okay? There's, there's a cable running down here, which we'll have to be very... Okay, good. Okay, let's... There we go. Look at that. Now, these electrical wires here are going to be a problem, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to take this electrical box out, pull these wires up, and run them through this wall stud, down on the inside of the wall on this side and put a new box in here. With the wall prepared, it's time to start building our cabinets. They'll consist of a top, bottom, sides, back, and shelves. 
First, we'll rip all the parts except the back to the same width using the table saw. When it comes time to cut the pieces to length, it's obvious that Hannah is an eager learner. Yeah, see this corner right here? Just imagine you're going to push this wood right into that corner with this out of hand, okay? Okay, then go ahead and cut. Back indoors, we lay out the cabinet sides on a work table. On top, we place samples of the various storage containers the girls will be using. Now, the idea here is to figure out the best shelf spacing. Once we've done that, we draw the shelf locations on all four sides at the same time. Can we put some on? Say yeah. All right. Young Gracie applies wood glue to the end of a shelf as we begin to assemble our cabinet. A little more. Wonderful. There you go. Thank you. All right. The top, bottom, and shelves are placed in between the sides, held in position temporarily with clamps, and then secured with nails. Right. Hannah, you're a natural. I think I'd ask Mom and Dad for a cordless screwdriver for Christmas. Not to be outdone by her sister, Hannah lays down a near-perfect bead of glue for the back of the shelf. The idea is to get it flush on all the edges, so just use your fingers and feel. Once in place, the quarter-inch plywood back is attached with nails. And guess who does the nailing? Looks great. Yeah, it does look great. Okay, Steve, let's see if this fits. All right, that looks great. Hannah, could you bring some clamps over yeah, there? You did a fine job right. on there. Confident. Good job! Perfect! A real nice fit. Now we clamp the shelf to our wall stud, making sure the face of the shelf is perfectly flush with the face of the drywall. Okay. Yeah, I was apprehensive at first, and but once we got in the thick of it and first couple cuts, and I got used to it. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. After drilling a pilot hole and countersink, we attach the shelf to the stud. Shims help us keep it level and plump. All right, looks good. Very nice. Katie wants the shelves to have a whimsical frame with sweeping curves. And up and down. Now we can go up. So she first tapes paper on the wall. Then mom and daughter sketch the frame outline. Yeah, we'll straighten that up. We carefully take the paper down, and then up go strips of quarter-inch thick plywood. The installation is temporary, so we just tack the plywood in place with a few small nails. The spray adhesive is applied so that we can temporarily attach the strips of paper to the surface of the plywood. Hold this up, Katie, if you can align those okay. reference marks now. After trimming off the excess paper, we remove the plywood and cut it to shape, using the paper pattern as a guideline. This is a very satisfying creative challenge because we're able to incorporate a lot of elements here. We're able to take something that's solid like wood, but it's also organic, and we can make it appear fluid. Mm -hmm. OK, good. Now, I've never done this either, and I've been always wanting to experience it. Now it's time to install the family work of art. We apply some panel adhesive to the back of the frame sections, then nail them to the edge of the cabinets. Now remember, this is the bay that we couldn't use because it had the plumbing inside. And uh, Katie came up with a great idea, which was to put a bulletin board up here. So that's exactly what we're going to do now. We've moved the electrical outlet from down here, up here. We patched up our hole, and I'm ready to put this up. So we'll start by putting some uh, construction adhesive or panel adhesive on the back of our cork board here. So let's drop this inside our frame, cut this to fit. One last piece of trim completes this okay, Gorman Love original, and our shelves are now a piece let's, of art. Uh, let's do our last bit of nailing here. So what do you think? You love Great. It. Better than we expected. Not nice. And Absolutely. It. And it was so much fun having the kids involved in building something for their own room. Mm -hmm. And Hannah has definitely got a future in power tools as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> uh, I have a favor to ask you. When you get this painted, would you send me a videotape of that? Sure. Absolutely. Love to see the sure. sure. 
Well, the tape arrived, and as you can see, the paint job added just the right finishing touch. The color's good. My guess is that when it came time to brush on that paint, Mom had more than a little help from the family's budding artists. Say hi to Ron. As a do-it-yourselfer, you know that prying things apart is a very common task. No doubt, you also found that it's important to have the right tool for the job. These are some of the prying tools that have proven most useful to me in the past. Now, I'm going to add another. It's called the trim puller, and that's exactly what it excels at doing. The trim puller by Zenith Industries was designed to remove wood trim without damaging either the wood or the walls. The ground bevel on the edge allows the tool to be easily driven between the trim and wall. The integrated center wedge then continues to separate the materials. In some cases, this wedging action alone is enough to complete the job. The trim puller is designed to be leveraged side to side. Because of the wide contact area and greater leveraging effect, trim removal goes faster while wall surfaces remain undamaged. The tool quickly, easily, and safely removes shoe molding, baseboard, chair railing, and door casings. It's ideally suited for lifting carpet tack strip and edging. The trim puller can also be used for prying off molding from decorative panels or doors without the risk of damaging either. It's also quite effective at removing ceramic tile. The integrated center wedge combined with the tool's wide surface area enable it to quickly pop tile away from the surface beneath. The trim puller can be used as a temporary shim when leveling base cabinets or for prying off cabinet countertops that have been glued or nailed in place. It even comes in handy when replacing damaged floor planks. Removing shoe molding, baseboards, chair railing, door casing, carpet strips, tile, and more. It's always impressive when a single tool can do so many things so well. Well, it's traveling time again, and I'm headed to Brunswick, Maine to visit Steve and Mercy Norman. Good morning, Mercy. Good morning, Ron. Hey, Steve. Good How morning. Are you? Good. Oh, boy, I had a wonderful night's sleep. Oh, good. And this coffee cake is fantastic. Oh, I'm glad you're enjoying it. So what are we going to do today? Well, today we're going to head up... Mercy and Steve explained that most of the house. interior oh, woodwork at the inn is quite detailed, reflecting the elegance and style typical of the larger 19th century homes in town. But one room, most likely the housekeeper's quarters in earlier times, has trim that is painfully plain by comparison. Instead of replacing it, Mercy and Steve have come up with another idea. Well, the idea, I think, is to try to not tear off, not to remove the existing, but to build upon that using these standard pieces and just adding to it. And that, that little bit of detail as it Makes runs, a big difference. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, listen, why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, put some of this on the baseboard mm -hmm. and around the door casings and just see how that looks and what, where we want to go from there? Sounds good. Sounds good. Perhaps the most important part of any molding job is accurate measuring. Two important tips here. One, make sure you're at eye level when reading the tape measure. 15 sixteenths. And two, it's always better to be a little long than short. You can always cut a bit more off. 87. So we set up shop in a nearby room that was, until recently, their son's bedroom. Now, Steve, you know this, but Mercy, this is, uh, let me just go over what a miter cut is. It actually is an angle cut, usually on the end of a piece of wood. And most of the miters that we're going to be cutting today will form an angle of 90 degrees. This is the kind of miter that we're going to be working with today. So let's start by taking one piece, one long piece of molding right here, and cutting a 45 degree miter on one end. There you go. Okay. Okay, Mercy, you want to do this? Just okay. press that down onto the table, back toward the fence with your left hand. Go ahead and make your cut. Good. Now this piece of molding is going to have a miter cut on both ends of it. Whenever that's the case, you want to cut the miter on one end first and then measure from that 
to the location of the second miter. Here's a tip. For a more exact measurement, instead of using the hook at the end of the tape measure, try placing the one inch mark at the edge of the wood. Just make sure to add that inch back again at the other end. Our measurement is 79 and 7 sixteenths. You want to make it 80 and 7 sixteenths. With the power miter saw set to 45 degrees, Steve cuts the molding to length. There's Steve. How does it fit, bud? Well, I think it's right the pretty good. Okay. So what's the There's nothing like a nail gun for installing molding quickly and easily, especially in an old home like this where pounding on a wall with a hammer can cause cracking and damage fragile plaster. Although with proper eye protection, a nail gun is perfectly safe, there is a back blast of air and sometimes it can be a surprise. A few more nails and Mercy uses the gun like a champ. Well, this looks good. What do you guys think? It gives it more depth. Is that enough? No. I think it needs something. I think, um, I think if, we, if we added another piece of trim on the face of the flat part here, came down, that would start to give it that build-up effect that we're looking for. Okay, a little more thickness, a little more detail. So then that would run where? All the way down to the carpet? But I don't think it should end at the floor. It seems like it should stop before that. She's right. Normally, this would, would stop on a block down here. Sure. Like a plinth block that kind of you use on a, on a mantle or something right, like that. Right, exactly. A plinth block is a decorative piece of woodwork that can simulate the base of a column when it's used at the bottom of a door or as part of a fireplace surround. That looks good. That looks good. I'm just wondering, though, if we couldn't maybe put some kind of detail on the face of this, maybe make it up with some, some of the molding that we've got. Get a little creative. Would you like that? Yeah, that would be good. All right, let's try it. Let's try it. Now, here's our chance to be creative. Steve pulls out some leftover half round, which we cut into short pieces with miters on both ends. Applied to the face of the block, these will form a sort of raised panel look. It's a simple touch, but one that adds a nice detail. There you go, Steve. Got a coat of primer on that. Okay. With the plinth blocks in place at the bottom and corners, it's time to add the finishing touch. A piece of decorative molding to the face of the door casing. This will create not only more detail, but the appearance of greater thickness. Now this is the final piece I had in mind. Piece of shoe molding. Right. Ah, I like that. Oh, it balances off this piece that we put on up here very nicely. And I like the way that it finishes off into the plinth block here. Okay, let's nail it on. Good. Okay. Applying caulk to the seams, or any place there's a gap, will give this or any molding job an absolutely professional look. A coat of semi-gloss enamel, and this molding now lives up to the heritage of this 1890s home. Transformed from servants' quarters to guest quarters, the Brunswick Bed and Breakfast has an elegant vacancy just waiting to be filled. To view today's projects again, visit ronhazelton.com. Step-by-step -step home improvement tips when you need them. Let Ron show you how to do it yourself.